The historical geography of the eastern townships in Quebec is very closely linked with its waterways. The waterways were the veins and arteries that penetrated into every corner of southern Quebec. During the early 19th century, the St. Francis River watershed was key to patterns of communication, settlement, transportation, water power, and industry. This documentary concerning St. Francis River crossings will begin in the lower St. Francis River Valley as it flows through the counties of Richmond and Drummond and former seigneuries where it empties into the St. Lawrence River at Lake St. Peter near Odenac. The earliest settlement routes from New England and Quebec City with destinations to the eastern townships will be traced as well as the early economic growth in the lower St. Francis River Valley that ensued. But most importantly, it will provide evidence of the many and varied river crossings at towns, hamlets, and countryside locations along the St. Francis River, which bound together the web of human activity in the early 19th and 20th centuries. The Abenaki showed the routes from New England via the Connecticut River system to the St. Lawrence River at Lake St. Peter. They settled at Odenac and Wollanac, which are permanent sites located near Pierreville and Baconcourt, which were likely in existence since the 1670s. These earliest settlement routes followed the basin of the St. Francis River system from New England and served as the water communication network between the Connecticut River and the St. Lawrence River systems. Prior to 1791, the British establishment in Quebec City had purposely kept southern Quebec closed to settlement in order to act as a buffer zone between the newly independent United States and British North America. After 1791, this policy of exclusion by the British government in power in Quebec City at that time allowed trade, population, and military movement to begin. Some 20,000 New Englanders came to the eastern townships in the first major wave of settlement between 1781 and 1830. But in 1815, disbanded soldiers of the War of 1812 to 1814, under the command of Major General Frederick George Harriet, were brought to Drummond County to settle and begin a new life. Other settlers from England and Scotland arrived later, but mostly by American routes. However, following the establishment by Alexander Galt of the British America Land Company in 1833, which was headquartered in Sherbrooke, immigrants from the British Isles were encouraged to settle in Quebec's eastern townships, and by mid-century in the 1840s, approximately 3,000 immigrants had arrived from Ireland during the famines, with a further 1,100 arriving from Scotland, England, and Wales. Lands being cleared along the St. Francis River for the development of an agricultural economy were found to be better in the higher elevations, where lighter, well-drained and fertile soils were abundant. A proliferation of small mill towns emerged on major and minor water power sites along the St. Francis River. Sawmills, gristmills and a number of small manufacturing establishments dependent upon local supplies of raw materials, for example wool, were established and often a village grew up around such places. In 1815, the Surveyor General of Lower Canada, Joseph Bouchette, published a topographical description of the province of Lower Canada, in which he described the navigation of the St. Francis River as being difficult and exceedingly laborious with many portages to circumvent the rapids and turbulent waterfalls. Navigation from Lake Memphremagog to the St. Lawrence was made difficult by many powerful obstructions, such as the Great Brompton Falls in Richmond County, about two miles in length. The cargo on the boats and the scows had to be unloaded at the head of the falls, 
and then carried to the end of the falls, where empty boats which had been floated down the west side of the falls were met. Again, the boats were reloaded, and then continued about seven miles further to Little Brompton Falls, where a repetition of the previous labor took place. It was then a distance of 15 miles from Brompton Falls to the Kingsley Township Portage, with more dangerous currents to maneuver. From there to the Minute Falls, some 20 miles downstream, it was clear sailing. But portages were needed again at Minute Falls, and also two miles further down the river at Lord's Falls. An additional dangerous rapid known as Spicer's Rapids occurred at six miles below Lord's Falls. Finally, all problems were left behind as the St. Francis River flowed freely into Lake St. Peter on the St. Lawrence River. According to Mr. Bouchette, in 1815, more than 1,500 barrels of ashes, or potash, were brought down the river during that summer. Beginning in Brompton Township in Richmond County, three bridges were constructed for road and rail traffic to cross the St. Francis River. Two bridges have crossed the river at the same place. The first bridge, a covered bridge, was constructed in 1891, and it was named the Mercier Bridge. It was taken out by ice in 1902 and was rebuilt in 1903. It existed until the ice jam in 1948 when the bridge was destroyed. The third and present bridge was rebuilt across the St. Francis River and allows Highway 243 to cross. A rail bridge built and operated by the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railroad Company allowed trains to make one of several river crossings on their way to and from Portland, Maine. First built in 1852, it was renewed in 1948 after ice damage. It was totally rebuilt in 2019 following the collapse of the old bridge caused by major ice damage on January 13, 2018. Leading names of settlers who brought agriculture and industry to Brompton were Addison, Barnes, Bishop, Brooks, Cox, Gardner, Hyde, Knapp, Moray, Pierce, Robinson, Varney, Wakefield, and Wilcox. The chief industry, pulp and paper manufacturing, was established in the early 19th century and continues to this day. The Brompton Falls Pulp and Paper Company, formed in 1900, utilized the water power generated at Brompton Falls in the manufacture of Greenwood Pulp. The officers of the company were Director E. W. Tobin from Bromptonville, President George P. Pierce and Treasurer W. N. Monroe, both from Auburn, Maine. Construction of the dam began in 1901. About 1908, the Brompton Pulp and Paper Company converted its soda mill to craft pulp, becoming the first craft paper mill in Canada. Later, Kruger took over the manufacture of newsprint and specialty papers. In 2020, Kruger stopped the production of newsprint in favor of the production of 100% recycled biodegradable paper approved for direct food contact. A ferry and three bridges, the first bridge being a covered bridge, as well as two crossings to Coney Island, a recreational island, have graced the Windsor scene for more than 150 years. The first river crossing here was a ferry operated by Mr. Wirtel from Rankins in Greenlee to Wirtel's Landing in Windsor Mills from 1872 to 1875. In 1875, a covered wooden bridge was built to replace the ferry between Brompton, later named Greenlee, 
and Windsor Mills by the Windsor and Brompton Bridge Company. With two piers in the river, this strong bridge was wide enough for two horse-drawn vehicles to pass. However, it was taken out by high water and ice in March of 1898. This toll bridge was built of steel by Dominion Bridge Company for the Windsor and Brompton Bridge Company on the same footprint as the wooden bridge, except that it was raised several feet higher. The bridge was freed of toll on July 1st, 1915. In 1867, the bridge, which was located in the mill yard of Canada Paper Company, was reported unsafe and another bridge was built in 1877 to replace it. Then in March 1900, the road was rebuilt 150 feet above the old location and a new steel bridge 25 feet wide was constructed there. This holiday resort was built on an island that was owned by René Hébert, a tailor of Windsor. There was a bridge suspended by cables on the east side of the island. On the west side was a floating wooden bridge. Also, a ferry would run from the dam, the paper mill, over to the island. It carried 28 passengers and the cost per person was 25 cents each way. It is interesting to note that the original name, Windsor Mills, was changed to Windsor on the 19th of February, 1914, as sanctioned by the Legislature of Quebec. Leading names of early settlers who were influential in public affairs of Windsor were Captain Josiah Brown, G. A. Dearden, Gilbert Farquhar, Abbott Fry, and Charles Wortel. Brompton, which was later named Greenley, was established on the west side of the St. Francis River, opposite Windsor, and was first settled by people from England and Scotland. Prominent names such as Addison, Gardner, Greenley, Knapp, Lazenby, Pierce, Rankin, Smith, and Stevens were involved in public affairs here. The Windsor pulp and paper industry began in 1859 and continues to this day. The first soda pulp mill in Canada was established here in 1865 by Angus, Logan, and Thompson. The village of Kingsbury is located in Richmond County on the Salmon River about four miles from the St. Francis River. Kingsbury was a lumber village. Matthew Clark built and operated Clark Sawmill and Gristmill circa 1840. Later, Williamson and Crombie successfully ran the sawmill for export of hardwood for sale in Montreal and the United Kingdom. Railways gave Kingsbury the advantage of having transportation to the larger world markets. The Kingsbury area, notably at New Rockland, was also famous for the quarrying of slate. Several quarries were opened, employing some 300 men, many from Wales and in Cornwall in England. The productive period was from 1860 to 1890. Transportation of the slate was provided by horse-drawn teams which took the slate to the Grand Trunk Railway in Richmond. In 1891, the new Rockland Slate Quarry Railway, which was a narrow-gauge railway, was built. The new Rockland Slate Quarry Railway Bridge crossed the St. Francis River from Sloan Island to Corris near Windsor. It provided a needed link to the Grand Trunk Railway in order to send slate from the quarries at New Rockland to the country's markets. It was an interesting small covered bridge. The Rockland Covered Bridge spanned the Salmon River near Kingsbury, which made it possible for slate quarriers lumbermen and local folk to cross the Salmon River. It was reported in a local newspaper that Colonel Harkham of Melbourne had received a contract from the municipality of New Rockland to put a bridge across the Salmon River, utilizing one of the spans of the old Richmond St. Francis Bridge. This would make three municipal bridges that the Colonel had built from spans of this old bridge.
A variety of river crossings were evident over the years at or near Melbourne Township and the Richmond area. Included were two ferries, three covered bridges, two steel bridges, and a railroad bridge. This covered bridge was built at the cost of $1,138 by William Hood and Sons of Montreal. Specifications called for a latticework type of bridge, 88 feet in length by 16 feet in width. Timber forming the latticework were 3 inches by 10 inches, pinned together by 1.5 inch wooden dowels. Heavy squared timbers were used for the sills and plates of the structure. The floor of 3 inch planks ran lengthwise of the bridge. Sadly, it was destroyed by arson in 1988. A ferry existed between Upper Melbourne, near the foot of Cemetery Road, and the first train station at the Woodyard on the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railway. It is known that the clergy of Richmond and other prominent folk preferred to live in Upper Melbourne to escape the smoke, noise, and dirt of the railroad. The folk of Melbourne also needed a way to cross the river, and a ferry was the obvious choice for the early years. However, about 1847, the residents began to agitate for a bridge to link the two villages. Squire Daniel Thomas of Upper Melbourne unsuccessfully presented his plan for a floating bridge to the officials in Quebec City. But some months later, the provincial government countered with a plan for a toll bridge. Following much negotiation about the costs, an agreement was made with Chamberlain and Merrimer to do the work for $4,205 with Mr. R. Lewis as their foreman. The work on the wooden bridge began at a site just above the eddy in Melbourne to a point in Richmond close to the Boston Last Factory. Mr. Lewis of Melbourne was the superintendent of works, and a Richmond blacksmith, Mr. Ephraim Driver, was reported to have made all the spikes and nails for the new bridge. The toll keepers believed to have been Mr. Ned Cooney. The wooden bridge was condemned after many years and the decision was made to replace it with a steel bridge. But the location of the steel bridge nearly caused a civil war. The Upper Melbourne people wanted it to be built as close to the location as the covered bridge as possible. The Lower Melbourne folks agitated for the site of the present bridge. It was the Alberton populace who took sides in favour of the Lower Melbourne protagonists. This toll bridge was built of steel in 1882 for a cost of $45,000. It was 800 feet long with five spans and was owned by a joint stock company. However, the bridge was not long lived. Two spans on the Melbourne side were taken out by ice seven years later in 1889 and the ferry was again put into use during repairs. Then in 1891, the whole bridge was carried down the river by ice, necessitating the use of the ferry again. Until recent years, severe flooding, often associated with spring runoff, has been recorded in every month of the year on the St. Francis River. The towns of Brompton, Windsor, and Richmond are very vulnerable to flooding due to the high levels of discharge from five tributaries of the St. Francis River near Sherbrooke namely the Ascot, Moe, Coaticook, Massawippi, and Magog rivers, during spring breakup. Also, outcrops of bedrock constrict the lower St. Francis River in several places, 
giving rise to ice jams. The flood of April 19, 1982 was one of the largest on record. Until recent years, fish were abundant in the river and provided a vital food source for the population and a recreational attraction for the region. Until the construction of dams for industry, Atlantic salmon ran up the St. Francis and its tributaries. In fact, fish were so plentiful that in the early days of the Grand Trunk Railway, it was told that the railway workers requested that they not be fed salmon more than three times per week. Other fish found naturally in the St. Francis were lake and brook trout, yellow perch, muscalange, sturgeon, and lake whitefish. Named in honor of Mr. Peter Samuel George McKenzie, the local member of the Legislative Assembly for Richmond, who served as a provincial treasurer, this toll bridge was built for a cost of $51,000. The toll was removed in 1913, when a great celebration took place for the freeing of the bridge. A sign posted on the bridge for many years, Walk or Pay $10, was required to keep the bridge from shaking when in use. Horses were not allowed to trot and soldiers had to break step as they crossed the bridge. Today, in 2021, the bridge, which has been well maintained, still stands and remains in constant use. In July 1964, the Quebec provincial government awarded a contract to Quebec Engineering of Montreal of $1,020,000 to build a new bridge between Melbourne and Richmond, which would route through traffic around the town of Richmond and relieve congestion on Main Street. It was built in 1965 through 66 and allowed highways 116, 143, and 243 to cross the St. Francis River. It was known for many years as the Pont Neuf. In 2009, it was named in honor of the well-known Canadian artist and Upper Melbourne native Frederick Coburn by the Quebec Toponymy Commission. No single event has had such a tremendous influence on the early developments of the eastern townships, especially the St. Francis Valley, as the construction of the Grand Trunk Railway, wrote Dr. John Hayes in 1909. The old methods of transportation by water carriage along the St. Francis and Nicolet Rivers to the market towns of Quebec, Montreal, and Three Rivers, or the tedious stagecoach over badly constructed roads, soon became a thing of the past. Richmond County, being traversed by its main line along the St. Francis River and the Quebec Division running northward, owes much of its later growth to the railway operations. The railway was known as the Grand Trunk in Dr. Hayes' day, but when it first arrived in Richmond in 1851, it had been chartered as the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railway, the SL and AR. It was one of the first large-scale railway projects in Canada, and its completion put Richmond and the eastern townships on the map. The opening of newly found markets on the American side for products of the settler and easier access to older markets brought about increased opportunity for the utilization of natural resources of forest, farm, and mines. As a result, Windsor Mills, Danville, Brompton Falls, Kingsbury, and Melbourne had taken on a new and growing importance. Betsy Clark owned the land in Melbourne Township over which the SL and AR had to pass. The sale of the Clark land to the SL and AR in 1848 was key to the railway's development in the Richmond area, for the railway was planned to pass through Melbourne, not Richmond. Nevertheless, political maneuvering by Richmond officials shifted the railroad to the Richmond side of the river 
and resulted in the need for another railway bridge. This decision resulted in a costly venture, for it required an additional bridge at Brompton Falls to lead the rails back to the west shore of the river and into Sherbrooke and beyond. The Dominion Bridge civil engineer engaged for the purpose was Casimir Zowski, great-great-grandfather of Peter Zowski of CBC fame, who planned and had a bridge completed from Betsy Clark's land on the west shore of the river bank to the east shore of the river, just north of Richmond. Alverton Municipality and Kingsley Township shared a St. Francis River crossing, namely a ferry which was manually operated by cables. It crossed from near the Anglican Church in Kirkdale to Trenumville near the United Church. Known as Hall's Crossing, it operated from the 1890s until World War II. Hall's Crossing was one of two other ferries that crossed the St. Francis River between Lavenir and Kingsley, namely the Husk Ferry, located below Alverton, and the McLean Jutra Ferry near Lavenir. The Husk Ferry operated from 1876 to 1921. It was a scow ferry with private roads leading to the St. Francis River on both the Lavenir and Kingsley sides of the river. It transported the local folk in their buggies and wagons, etc., or on foot. Cattle, horses, and farming needs were ferried across the river. A number of Lavenier children crossed the St. Francis River to receive their education at the Kingsley Consolidated School in Kingsley Township. From 1905 to 1952, the Kingsley Consolidated School known as the first consolidated school in the province of Quebec, continued to educate children from Lavenir and Kingsley townships. The Black River, known as the Alverton River on today's maps, joins the St. Francis River just below the village of Alverton on Highway 143, where a covered bridge was first built in the early 1800s. Another covered bridge at Blanchette's Mill, known as Moulin Allen d'Alverton, on Mooney Road, also spans the Black River and is located upstream, a few miles from the village of Alverton, at the site of the woolen mill. A most interesting river formation, the Bec du Canal, exists near the Long Point of Wickham Township. On the Long Point of Wickham, a very old cemetery circa 1815, also was in existence, and located close to the ancient Barlow Cemetery, the Barlow Ferry crossed to the Kingsley side of the St. Francis River. It is well known that the Abenaki, who had established a village near Lavenir, used the Bec du Canard area to portage to the Kingsley side to continue on foot to the aboriginal settlements of the St. Lawrence River. Major General Frederick George Harriet, who had distinguished himself during the War of 1812 to 1814 at several battles in Upper and Lower Canada, in particular, the Battle of Chrysler Farm, where we find Upper Canada Village today, near Morrisburg, Ontario, was given the task of founding a military agro-settlement on the banks of the St. Francis River, which became Drummondville. According to Maurice Vallée, historian, some 300 veterans of the War of 1812-14 to came with Harriet to this British military settlement but only 160 veterans followed the steps issued by the military in order to obtain 100 acres of land. These veterans hailed from Great Britain, Ireland, Scotland, Switzerland, France, Germany, Italy, and Poland, and settled in other hamlets along and near the St. Francis River in places such as Lavenir, Alverton, Wheatland, 
Sydenham Place, French Village, Upper Durham, and South Durham. There were many handicaps and disasters faced by the early settlers. Hardships faced by the veterans were profound. 1816 was known as the year without a summer, with frost and very cold temperatures which continued through July and August. The settlers dug up the seed potatoes for food and relied on the British military to keep them from starving. In 1826, the village of Drummondville experienced another terrible setback. A fire destroyed much of the village, except for the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. Rebuilding began immediately, and by the early 1830s, the village flourished again with two schools, two flour mills, four tanneries, four potash factories, a carding mill, and two stores. Before bridges were constructed at Drummondville, early roads and ferries were much in use. By the end of 1815, the colonists had carved out a footpath between the Drummondville hamlet and Saint-François-du-Lac. At the end of August 1816, 40 kilometers was completed between the village of Drummondville and the mouth of the St. Francis River. Christopher Myers had inspected 25 kilometers of the footpath by October 23, 1816, in the direction of Fort William Henry, now known as Sorel. Again, by August 1823, the following men were named commissioners for the opening of the route between Drummondville and Sorel. John Ployart, Robert Jones, Josiah Wortel, Frederick George Harriet. In 1824, a road 12 feet wide traversed the township of Grantham and Upton, following the existent road, which went through the Degier Seigneurie and connected Drummondville to Sorel. Under Harriet's orders, a road between Drummondville and Nicolette was built, which was an extension of the Commissioner's Road from Sherbrooke under the direction of Mr. W. B. Felton of Sherbrooke. The northern end was located at Port St. Francis on the St. Lawrence River. This terminus had been purchased by the British American Land Company as a landing place on the St. Lawrence River for colonists destined for settlement in the eastern townships. Before bridges were constructed in Drummondville, a ferry crossed the St. Francis River at the end of St. George Street. In fact, there were two ferries, one at each side of the river. The this ferry was used before bridges existed and later when the bridge was taken out by ice on at least two different occasions. The first bridge was constructed in 1860 near the village of Drummondville and lasted a short two years. It was a covered bridge and was taken out by ice in 1862. The ferry was put into operation a second time and operated for 23 years until the second bridge was completed in 1885. Built by the Dominion Bridge Company, it was a toll bridge with fees of five cents for a carriage and two cents for pedestrians. A sign at each end of the bridge read, Défense de Traité. This iron bridge, 400 feet in length, was built at a cost of $18,000. It continues in existence to this day as it traverses Route 122 through Drummondville. In 1958, the present bridge on Auto Route 20 was completed. It was built to alleviate traffic in the center of Drummondville. The growth of the population in the Drummondville region and the increased economic activity linking both sides of the river led to the construction of an additional bridge across the river between 1972 and 1974. Situated where the former ferry crossed the river at St. George Street, it was named the Pont de la Traverse, and it connects downtown Drummondville with the St. Charles sector via Route 122. It remains the most used bridge in the region to this day.
The Drummond County Railway, chartered in 1886, was constructed in 1887 from a provincial subsidy of $96,000. The railway bridge and 30 miles of track was laid from Drummondville to Nicolette to connect the DCR to the Grand Trunk Railway Network. The major tonnage of the DCR was firewood and lumber. In 1899, the DCR was sold to the Government of Canada for $1,176,064. Industry sprang up in Drummondville and surroundings, partly because of a growing labor force, good transportation, and an abundance of water power, which could be converted to hydroelectric power for the operation of factories. For example, the growth of Bromptonville, Windsor, and Drummondville was largely dependent on the potential of water power. Southern Canada Power, for example, enabled such companies as Canadian Selenese to flourish. Pierreville is a municipality in Nicolette, Yamaska, located at the confluence of the St. Francis and St. Lawrence Rivers. Across the St. Francis River is the town of St. Francois du Lac, at the junction of routes 132 and 226. Odenac, the Abenaki Reserve, is an enclave within the city limits of Pierreville. Pierreville is famous for the manufacture of fire trucks. The firm Pierre Thibault Canada Limited built fire equipment here from 1938 to 1990. Today, the company Carl Thibault Fire Trucks continues to operate in Pierreville. Ferries and bridges played an important role in the history of these towns, as the photos will attest. Odenak is a name derived from the Abenaki word meaning in the village. It is partly within the city limits of Pierreville and located at the mouth of the St. Francis River and the confluence of the St. Lawrence River. The former convent at Odenak is the site of the Musée des Abenaki and is dedicated to the history, culture, and art of the Western Abenaki people. Alanis Obamsawin, a storyteller, singer, and film director, grew up in Odenak. In 2011, the only First Nation CJEP in Quebec opened its doors in Odenak. By the end of the 19th century, the lakes and rivers of the Lower St. Francis Valley were increasingly used for industry and recreation. For over half a century, the waters of the St. Francis had provided a living for those who worked the forests, the farms, and the mills of the eastern townships. The patterns of settlement, transportation, and industry serve as a tribute to those who live and have lived along its waterways and tributaries. <music> 